course, that's not good for it. <laughs> well, I know you don't believe me that this thing will run on DC. So I'm going to show you. So what Makita is saying is that because we have higher efficiency, the gear oil doesn't get as hot and you never need to replace it. Gentlemen, welcome back to the shop. Today is new tool day. So excited. We got a seven and a quarter hypoid saw. What the hell is a hypoid saw? I don't know, but we're gonna find out. There's a money shot there. Now a wiser man than me once said, don't turn it on, take it apart. Who am I to argue? I'm gonna ask you one thing though, overlook my purple hands. It's a natural adaptation to years and years of working in the cold. And uh, she's just as cold as a whore's heart in this garage here. Negative five degrees. Of course, I can't turn on the heater because it messes up the audio. So if you want to watch a review of some grinning idiot extolling the virtues of this saw, go elsewhere. Stop the video now because we're going to pick this apart good, bad, and different. I actually don't own many Makita tools. The tools I do own are the rat tail grinders because they've been a staple of industry for the past two and a half decades. They're friggin' awesome. So I figure Makita has been making tools for 75 years. They haven't changed hands, nothing like that. Not like not like the bullshit going on with Milwaukee or DeWilt or, or any of those American brands that are just actually owned by multinationals. And, and unfortunately, they've succumbed to the same marketing bullshit as everybody else. 15 amps, 2300 watts. A P equals IV 15 times 120 is 1800 watts. So this will only do, that's like three horsepower. Uh, this might do that for a millisecond on startup, but yeah, complete and utter bullshit. Now I'm not a big government guy, so I don't think we need legislation or anything, you know, stupid like that. Luckily, we don't get the government we pay for, but it'd be nice if somebody just told the truth. That's it, just, just tell the truth. And further, if this was actually 15 amps, it would blow the breaker all the time. Well, this is a little different, comes with the blade on and at least I got it on the right way and what you see is what you get. All you get is uh, an allen key and I really don't like the way they secure that. It's not in there very well. It's, I think you'd lose that pretty quick. Not, not positive enough. Strike one. On the plus side though it's nice and heavy, bulky, feels skookum. So right off the bat, we got a uh, plastic slidey useless chucher here. And what this is, is a voltage, a transient voltage suppressor. And it's got a patent number on it, but it's not a technical patent number. It's actually just a design patent number, which the design, the shape of this plastic thing, uh, it's not an actual technical patent. And what this does, uh, electrical motors are very electrically noisy. So what this does, it has a, a, a ferrite toroid so a donut and it prevents voltage very quick voltage spikes from getting back into the rest of the system so this will be a universal motor with brushes so we can run this on dc direct current if we had uh, 120 volts dc this would run just fine okay well enough pussyfooting around hey let's uh, get in this bad mamba jamma and see what we can see so a couple preliminary findings from the biopsy here we got the basal platen off and surprisingly they're using spring washers which are completely useless they don't work but they are cheap we got the rear bearing housing off and this is nice because they've installed it with the bearing number out of course if you're a pro you always put the bearing number where the guy who's got to fix it can see it without taking it apart. So that's nice without pulling the bearing, that is. So this is a shielded bearing and it's full of the delicious goo. That's a Ningbo Wang Feng bearing company. That's CHL, don't ask me how I know that. And a 6001Z. This is um, probably a deep groove ball bearing. It's nice and big. That's about a half an inch shaft there. Let's check that out, half an inch, yeah, and a uh, little over an inch OD. I'm going to go ahead and say that's a 12 millimeter shaft and maybe a 28, uh, 30 millimeter OD. Nice big skookum bearing for supporting the backside of this blade turny part. I also like that the lock pins have two positions so you don't got to turn it all the way around. Uh, to get the blade off. That's nice. Very thoughtful. 
Well, I just pulled this little part off, and this is interesting. It's a bladder in there. Uh, when this heats up, when the oil heats up, of course, if there's any air in there and the oil, when it heats up, it's going to expand. Of course, if it doesn't have anywhere to expand, it's going to blow the seal out, and you'll have the magic goo everywhere. Nobody likes the magic goo everywhere, so they built this bladder in to allow for the expansion and contraction of the hot or cool oil. Pulling the fasteners right out, because this is a hypoid gear set, I might need to uh, pull, rotate this as I pull. And there we go. Just fetched up on the brushes back here. So the input pinion should be free on the crown, so it's just a matter of getting this, uh, I think there's only one bearing. It's just a matter of pulling on these conveniently located tabs to uh, pop this out. Nope, oh, there we go. Ta-da! Okay, so clearly I'm gonna have to replace this magic goo. And it's got the uh, sulfury EP extreme pressure uh, gear loop smell. Very distinctive stank to it. And it's actually not that thick. If I had to guess, I'd say it'd be about a 70 weight. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and use uh, pretty much whatever I got. I, I think I got some 100 weight full synthetic that I'll put in there. Uh, I will look it up though, just to make sure it's not too, too special. Looks like we're gonna have to get out the big external snap ring pliers uh, to get this shaft and gear, crown gear assembly out. And of course, when you're using snap ring pliers, there is no more important rule than to throw your own personal responsibility for your own safety out the window and blame everybody else for your dunderheaded mistakes and injuries. So I'm gonna tell you to wear your friggin' safety glasses. Okay, so we're just gonna turn this over. And, uh, <laughs> there we go, didn't even need my fancy pliers. The uh, crown gear fell right out. So there's the shaft there, uh, there's a spacer in there, there's a woodruff key, I'll show you that, well it's a half half circle, half half moon thingy, and that's, uh, so that little guy there, that little guy there is what transmits all the power and torque to your blade. Pretty much guaranteed that's going to be your weak point. And that is what is going to shear if you have a little oopsie. So inside the gear housing, in the cavity, we have the oil gallery and we have a plastic flinger. You can see the tabs on here that would fling the gear lube around. And we also have a preload spring here. And these are two Belleville washers in series. See how they're, this dish is this way, this dish is that way, that means it's series and you get more stroke that way. If you put them in parallel, you would get less stroke, more force. So this preloads this crown gear against the pinion to give you the proper backlash. Okay class, I know you haven't been paying attention thus far, but listen up. I'm gonna tell you the difference between the worm drive of the skill saw and the hypoid drive of the Makita. I'm gonna start off with the differential in your car. The differential in your car is gonna be very similar to this hypoid except it's a spiral bevel and the hypoid is a type of spiral bevel but the pinion is going to engage the crown in your car straight through the center of this shaft this hypoid gear set is essentially the same thing but it engages lower down and the worm gear is going to engage not on the face of the crown gear, but it's it going to engage on a worm on a wheel, and it'll be like a screw, like a bolt, and it'll engage on the bottom. And as this turns, as the screw turns, it forces the wheel to turn. Okay, so what are the relative disadvantages, advantages, and disadvantages of it? Well, this is pretty much just a marketing thing that they can call it a different gear set. Ooh, it's hypoid, oh. But essentially, the spiral bevel in your differential in your car is very efficient, and it can transmit lots of torque, but not as much torque as the worm and wheel. However, the worm and wheel is very inefficient because you have all this sliding friction, yada, yada, yada. 
So this hypoid, it's in between the efficiency of a spiral bevel and the torque of a worm and wheel. So it's kind of the best of all worlds. You get better efficiency, not that we care in a tool really, and you get pretty good torque. <laughs> okay, so that's clear as mud, right? All you really need to remember is the differential in your car, the pinion goes right through the center, it's got high efficiency and lower torque. The hypoid gear set doesn't go through the center, but it still engages on the face of the gear. It's got good efficiency and good torque. And the worm and wheel engages on the periphery of the gear and it's got excellent torque, very high torque and low efficiency. So what Makita is saying is that because we have higher efficiency, the gear oil doesn't get as hot and you never need to replace it. Now I know from experience in industrial applications that fully synthetic gear oil is skookum as fuck. It lasts a long, long time as long as there's no contaminants. So now the worm and wheel, I haven't had a skill saw part, maybe somebody out there has, is the worm and wheel, uh, a steel worm and a bronze wheel? Because that would mean that uh, you're probably going to get a lot of contamination from the bronze wearing down and you have to change the gear oil frequently. Right, we're onto the motor rotor. Nice big commutator bars and this has been tested. You can see it has been tested. And a nice skookum wire, it's 18 gauge, one millimeter. And a nice Chinese NSK bearing. This one's sealed, so there'll be some uh, grease in there. It won't be lubricated by the oil. And the backside is shielded and it'll just have some grease in it. So that's the difference between a shielded bearing and a sealed bearing. Of course, the rotor fan, nice uh, stiff blades on that. And just for shits and giggles, we're going to use this craptacular USB microscope to check out the surface finish of this gear. So there's the periphery of the gear, the outs of the OD of the gear. You can see the machining marks, hasn't been ground. There's the top of the gear. If I can uh, get a little more focused. There we go, there's the top of the gear. There, some machining marks and uh, already some chowdery looking bits there, but that's just the wear in. Now let's uh, take a look at the uh, bearing surface of the gear, the part that actually does the work. So there we see, we got some grinding marks there. Nothing too serious. Yeah, so there we can see where the pinion is actually bearing in the center of the screen. Uh, yeah, it looks like an okay gear, Not you know, nothing, definitely an odor of magnitude better than what you would get from the Harbor Freight. Getting ready to put this together, this uh, kind of blows. I guess Makita wasn't expecting weirdos to take it apart just for the fun of it. There's no speck on the oil and there's also no quantity of oil to put in there. So I'm gonna go ahead, I know the skill saw worm drive takes 80 weight, so I'm gonna go ahead and get some 70 weight and put about that much in. Okay, got the oil in there, now what is the grease for? Well, from experience, you can fight for half a day with these Woodrow keys, or, this, here's a tip for you, worth the price of admission, dab a grease, jam it in there, then it doesn't fall out when you're trying to put the gear back on. You're welcome. Well, chillins, it is time for a big old slice of humble pie. I had to knock the shaft clean out of the housing because when you go to put the gear on, it does one of these. Oh, ho. and of course, uh, no es bueno if it's free to turn. So I uh, pulled it right out and, uh, you know, I, I've been messing with it for like 30 minutes, uh, whispering sweet nothings, you know, treating it real gentle. And still, it didn't want to go. So I pulled the shaft out and doing it on the bench here and hoping for the best. Ah, ah, there we go. Easy as that. Okay, the supper bell has rung. I got the heater on, it's colder, it's friggin' here. So uh, before I wash my hands though, I'm gonna see if the wife can figure out the vintage of gear lube. 
Please enjoy this brief intermission while I go down to the lobby and get myself a drink. Welcome back to the shop, gentlemen. Today is tomorrow, and I surely enjoyed that drink. I hope you enjoyed that brief intermission. Now, you'll notice I'm wearing gloves today, and that's because the gear lube stinks. And I haven't been told in so many words, but I did get strong-armed into wearing them today. My wife refused to fulfill her wifely duties. I tell you, finishing schools these days they ain't what they used to be. Honor and obey my ass, quote unquote. I'm just taking a file here and, and uh, seeing how, how hard this gear is, and it's uh, it's not that hard actually. So I just tested this shaft with the file, and it's quite soft. It's probably 1045. Good solid shafting, though. And there's just a Buna N, real pliable Buna N, a single lip seal, low pressure single lip seal. So, and there's no wiper or anything what they're doing is they're relying on the bearing and that race to uh, seal it up and the bearing is a shielded or rather it's a sealed bearing so that'll have grease in it uh, permanently lubricated and then this shaft comes up through okay so we're going to check the gear ratio now this outputs at 4500 rpm so i'm guessing this ratio is actually quite low probably in the two to three range five Five and a quarter to one. My mistake. A little bit off. So that's pretty incredible because thinking that 45 times five is almost 20,000 ripples this thing turns at. Crazy. Now that I got the pinion installed and I got the retaining plate, there's two index pins on there. You gotta be careful. A uh, little trap for home gamers and then you put these fasteners back in and that uh, retains the bearing in there and then I'm just doing the drip feed of the uh, 70 weight synthetic it leaks down in there nice and slow and again I don't know how much to put in there so about that much and for lube I'm using this Lucas 75140 gear oil synthetic it says right here the perfect hypoid gear oil I'm not recommending this at all. I recommend you use whatever Makita tells you to use. Unfortunately, Makita doesn't tell you to use anything. So, pretty much, you're on your own. Okay, let's uh, have a look at the backside now. One thing I don't like, and you can't get away from it, it's basically all tools are made in China now. Get over it, unfortunately. And the rear rotor bearing race boss is always plastic always plastic I don't know what kind of thermoset plastic this is but uh, we're gonna see at what temperature it melts so that we know how hot the bearing can get before it uh, messes up the housing melts the housing softens it up and then it moves around and we're at 150 C and we're gonna see if that melts the plastic no it does not melt the plastic at 150 C okay up to 250 C does not melt the plastic I'm going to jump straight to 350C. And no surprise, 350C melts the plastic, but not nearly as quickly as I would think. We're going to drop it down to 300C and see what that does. So a hot soldering iron at 300C barely touches it, which is actually pretty amazing when you think about it. So obviously this plastic that they use can take a lot of heat, which is surprising to me. Now, of course, it's not as good as the magnesium of the skill saw because it's plastic. I mean, it's just not as good. It is lighter though. Frankly, if you're looking for a lighter saw, you're gonna use a sidewinder or not a worm drive, or in this case, a hypoid, blah, blah, blah. And the brushes are nice and big, scook them. That's good. And they're quite long, you got a long ways to go there. And better still, the brush housing is a thick 
bronze or brass, uh, really nicely machined, broached, rectangular keyway there for the brush to slide in and out of. Very nice machining actually on this, clean. Okay, I got her back together with no spare washers left over, oddly enough, and we're just gonna have a look at the trigger switch. It's a nice solid snap action trigger switch. And oddly enough, this is a Satori, I believe it's made in Japan, it doesn't say, but it's listed. So it's UL, uh, well, it's RU, US and uh, Canada approved, which is odd. You would think that they wouldn't go through the expense of getting a listed switch since the whole tool is going to be tested and listed. So this is a 15 amp snap action switch, nice positive snap action. And this is what's going to give you the most hassle long term in your tool. Uh, the brushes of course need changing and a lot of times the switch goes. So that's the first thing you always look at is uh, the switch when your tool's not working. Uh, one thing that's interesting here, they've got in that uh, cab tire cord, they've got some fiber and they've, instead of just nipping that back, they've actually added a, a strain relief and uh, tied a knot around this post. Now one thing I do not like is this excess amount of wire and you can see where it's been pinched by the case. So I'm just about to plug this in to see if I put it back together properly. And I really don't like the cord. They're cheaping out on this cord. It's a different material than Makita used to use. And you can see here, it's actually, well, it's, it's not laying flat. It's got some kinks in it. No big deal. It's been in the box, right? But, um, but the jacket is delaminating. And also, these used to meet the 90 degree C spec for both the Underwriters Laboratory and the CSA. It's uh, American Wire Gauge 14, so it should be nice and skookum. But this SJ spec, it meets it for Underwriters Laboratory in the US for 90 C. But it doesn't meet it for the CSA, the Canadian Standards Association, SJ. It's only rated at 60 C. So that tells us two things. One, the Canadian spec is higher than the US spec. And two, they're using a crappier cord. It's a Ta Ting brand. Oh no, the dreaded bat. Well, we are ready to operate this thing. And uh, just to show, we got 123 volts root mean square, 60 Hertz. We're gonna plug it in. Okay, we're gonna check the inrush current here on first start up without the blade on. So the inrush current was 41 amps. Running current on start up. Wow, that is intense. That was eight amps. Just uh, windage, just, just turning the thing with no blade or nothing, not cutting nothing. So because I replaced the brushes and yada yada yada, I imagine if we run this for a little bit, it's gonna come down. I change the range there just to uh, single digits. Well, we can see there we ran it for about two minutes and it was coming down. It'll probably level off around five or six amps there once the grease and the oil gets up to temperature and the brushes wear in. I'm going to check the resistance of the motor 1.6, 1.5 ohms. So we're looking at about uh, 80 amps at 120 volts DC which is a lot, but I have a feeling if we torque stall this, the locked rotor torque would probably more be more like the input current on AC, which would be right around 40 amps. So I got the 1kVA Variac, which is just a variable transformer. It's an auto transformer, not a isolation transformer. And uh, all we're gonna do is we're gonna torque stall the saw and then bring the voltage up real slow and keep an eye on the amperage so we don't blow this out. 
and that is just to see what the lock rotor torque is. Okay, so I don't even have this torque stalled yet, but uh, I'm just going to pull the trigger and we're going to start cranking up the voltage. We can see at uh, 10 volts AC, we're already at 2 amps. So if it's linear, we'll be at 20, but it's probably not linear. Let's uh, 20 amps. Let's go 20, and we're starting to turn there now. 16 volts. 20, we're almost 4. So let's see if we can torque stall that now. There we go. So we're at 4 torque stalled, 20 volts. You can hear it humming pretty good. All I do, I got the uh, the pin, the lock pin, engaged. Let's bring it up here. I'm gonna bring it up to 30 volts. Hear it really humming there now. So it's not linear. Of course, that's not good for it. <laughs> no surprise, it's not good for it because it's got no cooling when we do that. Nothing's turning. I really don't want to bring it up much past that, but we'll bring it to say 35. You can hear it just a humming away there. Doesn't sound too happy. There are 30 volts for 10 amps. So you would trip your breaker in a real hurry if you ever torque stalled this. But that's what breakers are for. Okay, so what's that actually mean to you and me, the guys with the big arms and the little heads on the dumb end of the tape measure? What it means is this thing's got balls to spare. You're cutting your dripping wet bird's eye maple fence posts all day. You ain't gonna run out of torque. What you're gonna run out of is electricity. Long before this thing stalls, you're gonna trip your breaker. You wanna run either no extension cord or a big fat extension cord. I'm talking 12 gauge, I'm talking 10 gauge, I'm talking triple lot welding cable. And you're gonna to wanna to run it on a 20 amp breaker. This is a beefy, hungry, hungry saw and you gotta feed it if you want it to perform. Because the breaker is the weak point in the system, the saw is gonna last for Ever. Guaranteed. This is not a guarantee. Cut towards your chum, not your thumb. Now what the hell is this guy doing, you think of yourself? Well, I know you don't believe me. But this thing will run on DC. So I'm going to show you. It'll run on DC. There we go. 84 volts DC. Zero amps. Let's give her a try. Son of a diddly. Not enough current. Well, clearly, I'm a filthy liar. Don't have nearly enough current to get this thing turning. So I yarded out my sealed lead acid boost pack and my spare battery and got it hooked up. 25 volts, zero amps. Let's pull the trigger. Maybe not a good idea. There you go. If you're ever stuck in a cave in uh, Turpalakistan and you need to MacGyver yourself a way out, you got yourself a high point saw and a couple of batteries, you are good to go. Now let's just stall this out, we'll torque stall this and see at 24 volts how many amps you're going to be drawing. Woohoo! Lots. 24 volts at locked rotor torque gives you 24 amps. That's DC, mind you. Well, we know those crowd of teeth mofos from Japan are lying to us about the power. Let's see if they're lying to us about the rotational speed. Right on the money. 
Well, that was cool. So this Makita is as well made a tool as you're ever going to get. Uh, I would prefer the magnesium body. This is a Skookum tool. It'll last me, uh, it'll probably outlast me. Well, I hope you enjoyed this in-depth technical look at the saw. Now, if you actually want to see it in action, you're going to have to go and check out some goofy-faced salesman's video. Uh, thanks a lot for watching. You got any questions, comments, please post them. I appreciate your input, especially if you got a good idea or something I missed. Uh, thanks a lot for watching. Keep your stick on the ice.